our last speakers of the afternoon are David and Marlene Nunn. And it's been a real pleasure getting to know them over the last year or so. And I'm very encouraged and inspired and challenged by their lives and their continued desired ministry. They're really my kind of people. And I wish I could just go over for tea or jump on their boat when they go to the Solomon Islands. And their topic and their uh, title is Hope for the Pacific Islands. They're an amazing couple and I welcome you. I, I can start my um, part of the presentation. Okay. Oh, I'll start with a little bit about us, um, our testimony a, a little so you can understand who we are and uh, then David will share more about the islands and um, his thoughts and so um, we're, we're David and Marling Nunn from New Zealand. We've come from a Pentecostal Trinitarian background. Even though we were taught the Trinity, um, it never made any sense to us. We couldn't grasp it and we couldn't believe the doctrine. It made no sense at all. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, it says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus, it's so clear to me and now know that one God and one man like us. David became a Christian 38 years ago and I accepted Christ as my saviour when I was seven years old and he told me at that moment I would be a missionary. It was no audible voice but an inner knowing of his will for me even at that age. We have always felt God's hand on our lives and even his healing power. When I was around eight years old, I had asthma. I couldn't run or exert myself and I would have trouble breathing a lot of the time. I'd heard that God can heal. So in my childlike faith, I believed he would. One day after seeking prayer in a church service, he healed me instantly. I knew he had healed me and I'd never had any asthma again. I had a sister who had the same thing. She had it all through her life. She died some time ago, but she it, it was in the family. So, you know, David also had a healing after a car crash. He was disabled and they said he would be in pain for the rest of his life. Five years later, he cried out to God for help and he healed him. I know that in evangelical churches today, we've witnessed the hyper faith and false moving of the spirit, but this wasn't like that. It was different. Over the last 20 years, we've been doing mission work in the Solomon Islands. The Solomons are made up of six major islands and around 900 smaller ones with more than 300 inhabited. They're an extremely poor country with the average hourly wage rate, if you're fortunate enough to get a job, being $4 Solomon or equivalent 48 cents American per hour. A can of Coke, for instance, would cost them $20 Solomon. So they'd have to work quite a few hours to earn enough even for a can of Coke. Their diet is simple and starchy, which can lead to malnourishment, vitamin deficiency and disease. Even though life is very tough for them, they will often treat us with generosity and give us whatever they have. Even their last portions of food, they really need for their own family. They also smile and laugh a lot, even when life is hard. It can take time to build relationships with them and earn their trust, as some have not been treated very well by foreign nationals. I remember an island man being treated badly by a white man. I apologised to him for the way he was being treated. He said that white man is here and black man is here. And that's just how it is. And I said, no, God doesn't see it that way. He sees that when that man treats you like this, 
that black man is here and white man is here because it's wrong what he's doing. And he was surprised at what he said, really? <laughs> is that right? Really? So it really gave him a boost to see how God sees him. We started helping out um, one hospital and the needs were such that it kept growing. We've sent many shipping containers of medical equipment and supplies, school books and clothing. As a lot of people only had one set of clothes, which are often rags, they would often avoid hospitals. We would pack clothing around medical gear with no gaps to be seen. We've done very large projects for these people as well as local community projects that empower them with their own income. After a few years, we decided this was far more important than having the things of this world. He has provided all our needs with our accommodation, workshops and storage and all personal needs. He has kept us all this time. David will share more on the islands shortly. A few years ago, I met by chance a pastor we knew years ago. He asked me if I would like to read something he had written about the Trinity. I said, you don't believe in the Trinity either, do you? And he didn't. It was the, I was the first person he had met in over 30 years of trying to share his Unitarian belief. This really stirred me up. And David and I started to really search out the truth and what we believe. We found Sir Anthony and Carlos, Sean Finnegan, Dan Gill, Brother Cal, Bill Schlegel, Greg Dybel, Tracy and others, reading and watching anything we could find. We had gotten so much wrong and what a joy to find the truth. We hope in the future, God willing, we will be able to share the truth of the gospel of Christ's death and resurrection in the coming King gospel of the kingdom and who Jesus Christ the Messiah really is to the people in the Solomons. I believe that the scriptures clearly instruct us in the Great Commission in Matthew 28 verse 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in Luke 10, verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I really believe time is short, the things that are going on in the world. So it is important to do all we can to reach people with these gospel truths while we have time. Okay, David will do his. Okay. Um, well, it's a kind of a pleasure to be actually listening to some of the people who we heard initially. We really thought we were alone in understanding the scriptures. Um, we're not, or weren't, and still are not great internet people. Um, we might be a generation back from there, and particularly going to the islands. Uh, the first 10 years of going there, there was no such thing as the internet. You know, it, it's foreign. There were no cell phones. There was nothing. When I first went, that was the, um, it was 20 odd years ago they were still involved in a civil war. It was the tail end of it. Um, it was either that trip or the next one. I landed on a plane and then we were getting off the plane onto the tarmac to go to the little terminal. And a military plane turned up. There were people with machine guns behind sandbags. And uh, it was a New Zealand Air Force plane bringing in a, a contingent of soldiers and it was interesting. They hopped out with their backpacks and their rifles ready, marching off the plane and two by two. And we were standing there in the middle of everything uh, watching this happen. But for me, it was horrific. I, uh, the first trip, I didn't know that there was a war going on. A, a friend had organized it for me. He, we had a, a business at the time and um, 
he said, can I come up? And he was dealing in what we, our business was involved with. He was looking for, for someone to sell product to. I was totally unaware of what was happening, but uh, the first day, um, it changed my Christianity, really. Going there, I just become aware of someone so close. That, 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 I don't know. I think it, at the time, it was about four hours flying time from New Zealand, a Pacific country. And we had a lot of Pacific people in the country that live here permanently. So they weren't foreign, but I, no one here even knew that there was a war on in the in the Solomon Islands. Um, to get there and then be faced with what was going on, um, it shocked me. I, I saw some horrible things the first day. Perhaps one of the most disturbing things, which really set this all off, even though we we really wanted to be uh, missionaries right from the start, we wanted to go and tell people and. We'd been traveling around the country at times in groups, uh, preaching to people, finding people, doing all sorts of things, trying to get ourselves ready. This we were unprepared for. Um, I, I realized my Christianity was really lacking. Um, to miss this sort of thing on my doorstep, but to see the, the desperation in people's eyes we were having dinner uh, at a chap's place. It was a secure place. Um, they lived on the business premises. We were just sitting down and then all of a sudden there were rifle shots and, and they all hit the floor. So I promptly got up and looked out the window, which in hindsight wasn't the smartest thing. But they were telling me to get down that they were shooting at us. And uh, <clears throat> I, I was just, I was unprepared for all that. Anyway, that stopped, and a bit later on, a chap turned up who knew the owner, and he was from a hospital in a big island called Malaita. Uh, I, think, I think he was the electrician at the site, but he had canoed for three or four days in a dugout canoe across the ocean to try and get supplies because they had nothing, not even Panadol is what he said that evening. Well, he got uh, that day that he had arrived, he had gone to the main hospital and the stores in the capital, which was next to where we were. And they just said to him, well, we have nothing either. You might as well go home. So for safety, he went to this chap he knew and he relayed what was going on. Um, during that trip, uh, I gave up on what we were doing as far as business goes, although I didn't say that at the time. When I got back to Marlene, I didn't say that either. I told her about what had happened. Now, if I can sort this thing, uh, to go to the next slide, Tracy, what do I do? Down, oh, down here, here we go. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if this is one of my photos. This is a nurse. His name was Ben from that hospital. I either, um, it might have been I took it when I was there. A lot of this was done with old uh, old cameras, so it was hard to get these pictures back. And Ben was in charge of the paediatric ward. Because I went around the hospital on my next trip, I went over there, and just to find out, to meet the people. Anyway, Ben held up that, and, and I said to him, you know, what, what do you people need? Maybe we can help out. And he said, this is the only towel I've got. Now, from memory, there, there was probably up to 30 children in there. Just an average kind of thing going on. Now, this hospital is one of the most remotest places you'll find. To get there is very hard. Certainly then it was ex exceedingly hard to get to the hospital. But they, they have had maybe for 60 years, 70 years, little towns were uh, villages, you know, they they were colonized and the, the gospel was preached to them as such. Uh, this particular one was Seventh-day Adventist 
and they built this small kind of hospital there. It had gone from, you know, quite good initially, but over the years it became very difficult to keep managing running that. It was quite hard to talk to Ben. All I could do at the time was say, it's up to God, because I really didn't know how how their needs could be met. But I had to have a look. Uh, this, I got called in to help in the operating theatre that they had. Now, I can't remember everything that was happening to this lady. It was some eye surgery. But on the left, you'll see the candle. That was the steriliser. They had, they had an old steriliser put in, an old um, electric one, I think, but that had broken many years ago. So they used coconut oil uh, to run a little wick candle. It was, it was hard, and it's not the only place in the world that's like that. But I admired the work that these people were doing under the circumstances. You know, they, they didn't have any kind of regular supply of medical, the very, very basic things, things you'd find in a, in a shop, down a corner shop. You know, you could buy bandages at your local shop. These people couldn't get anything. I'll go to the next one. So things changed. Um, when I came back from the islands, I found a few people, tried to explain what was happening. <clears throat> I'd... I'd contacted the hospital probably within a week of getting home and asked the doctor there. He was a Filipino chap, him and his wife, they're both doctors. He was a neurosurgeon. Um, send me a list or something. And they managed to get a note through to the capital and someone uh, got, got the details through to me. Well, we started a process of trying to get stuff. That's, some of you might recognize that person. I thought I'd put Marlene up. You know, we, we were given tremendous stuff at the time. Um, they needed a split image machine, which is actually in this um, <coughs> crate. We, we built crates if we got medical gear, and then we packed them with supplies for people. Um, we ended up... Uh, after a while, purchasing our own shipping containers so we could send things over economically. And and we've had so much help. This was a photo of our first two containers we sent up. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about the whole thing because it's indicative of the type of thing that happened. And it, it was also crucial for us um, to learn more of God. You know, God, he'd been teaching us things prior to anything like this, he has to make a vessel good uh, and worthwhile to go. You know, I, I personally had lots of struggles with Christianity. I, I knew nothing about Christianity till Marlene was at university and <clears throat> we were listening on a Sunday evening to a radio program. We were listening to the music, but every Sunday evening they had to put a religious program on. So they put Herbert W. Armstrong, which they did that as a joke, basically. They thought he's the most bizarre one out there. And yet the words he was speaking, he would speak scripture and it would make us think, what's all that about? <clears throat> so when she had finished and we came back to New Plymouth, it took Marlene a very short period of time. We ended up going to a Bible study course, which, which was good in many ways. Um, it took me a year and a half to realize that there was a God first, but I couldn't, I couldn't get it. And then someone said to me, do you, what do you know about Jesus? And, and after a year and a half of sitting in an intense course every week, I, um, I said, well, nothing. Who's he sort of thing. I'd completely missed anything about him. He told me I should read a book, uh, in the Bible, and that was the Gospel of John. You know. So I went back home and I opened the Bible and it opened to the Gospel of John. Now, like everybody else, there's a moment in your life when you realize and you 
immediately in your heart, you change, you're committed. And our, our hope always is that everyone is committed to the full. Even at that point, I knew <clears throat> what had just been given, the understanding had to be shared with everyone. So that's driven me. It's dri The same thing has driven Marlene. No, no, it drives you all. You know, there's nothing more in life. <clears throat> well, this, this picture, as I said, was our first one. We had people ring us who... One guy, he was in a place called Tauranga, a city across the other side of where we live. And on his desk, he was a doctor. He arrived in the morning. And there was a piece of paper put there with my phone number on it. So he phoned the number, just wasn't sure what it was about. No one was around. <clears throat> and I answered the phone and he started saying, who are you? And I'm saying, well, who are you? Um, I don't know you. And he said he was a doctor, and I said, well, perhaps you can help me. And it went from one thing to another. And we still have a relationship with that hospital. They gift stuff to us all the time. Well, according to the list that Dr. Lem from Atawifi Hospital sent to us, you know, we got, I don't think there was anything missed on the list, the things they required. Um, being a neurosurgeon, and he was one of the best in the Philippines before going to Atuifi. He had asked for a, a microscope. Now, most of this sort of stuff was quite new to me. And someone phoned us and said, look, would you like to come to this other city? We have an old hospital that refurbished another one in an adjacent town. And um, we got over there with a, a truck we hired. Um, Actually, no, we didn't hire it. It was just given to us to use, a big furniture truck. And we got taken through the old hospital, and there was all this stuff flying around that cleaned out most bits. And unbeknown to us, you know, we were just getting what we could, and we filled the truck. There's a church over there, met us, and, and they provided all these great workers. Well, you know, those things were many of the things for Atawifi Hospital. Well, these are some of the people. The local Seventh-day Adventist church had heard about what we were doing, which really surprised him. He knew nothing of us. They're, they're kind of, they stick to themselves and do their own thing. But this is their main auditorium, and we filled it for days. They ended up paying for two shipping containers for us. A lot of the workers were theirs, plus the church we were in, and others, just random people. These things were important, showing us the power of God and the needs of God and the prayer that goes into how things work and have continued to work. Try another slide. Um, on another trip to the same hospital as, you know, a bit later on, um, that said, you know, they really struggled. They had a little generator, something you could cart around on your back. Um, to power the hospital, which was very difficult for them to do things, particularly at night. And um, could we help? Well, going in this container, hanging off that truck crane, is a big generator that was given to us, a new one, and other items. We had three days to pack it. And for me personally, it, um, it was a great thing. You know, all these people came in to help and the, the skills they bought, they could do things that I could not do. Um, things had to be checked, loaded and so on. But on the second day into loading this, I, I, Marlene had said, you know, I had a car accident some years before and it, it was hard. I couldn't lift my hands above my shoulder height. Um, I had a lot of pills to keep me going during the day and night. It had been a difficult thing, but, you know, you know you have to keep going. Sometimes that's how it is. Virtually didn't pray about it. It was just, this is how it is. <clears throat> anyway, it was a church service on the Sunday, and at the church I thought, well, I couldn't stand for long, and everyone was standing and singing and 
and all the good things you do in church. And I um, I just said to the Lord, cried out to him, I can't do this. And I said, you need to heal me. I can't finish what I've started. And then the Lord healed me. You know, it, it was a moment that took me a while to understand because it's like, well, I know now he gave me a vision of what he was doing. Um, and I felt like water was pouring on my head and just filling me from top to bottom. And I, it's like I could see this line. It was a sort of greenish colored, I'll say that much. And, you know, when it got to my toes, the pain, um, it, it went. I only had one lung that worked and my other one worked and I took a deep breath. Um, that, was, that was pivotal for me. Uh, I could not give up after that point. You know, it's the power of God. I can't give an answer as to why some receive healing and some don't. I'm sorry, I, I have no understanding yet of that but I know that happened <clears throat> but it was it was instrumental for other people we had two local guys in the church we we're in and what sent these containers off at that stage there was very little shipping and it took a while to get to the capital now um, a chap from the Seventh Day Adventist Church had gone over uh, that offered to fund getting all the materials there. So he went over and <clears throat> he was organizing it uh, over there, all the shipping to go from international shipping to the hospital. Now, um, I know I have to speed up, but the two people who offered to come with me, one, he was poor. He uh, struggled to get anything and, and yet, he came to me one day and he said, look, I, would re I really think I, I would like to come. And I just said to him, do you have a passport? But he'd never been out of the country. He couldn't afford that. I said, well, if you can get a passport. We talked about how much it would cost. And he, I said, look, it's, it's about $2,000 to go and come back. And I said, leave that to God. Well, he did. The day he got his uh, passport, he received a check, a bank check, it's called, you know, it's unknown, it's just from the, the bank, for $2,000. So he knew it was time to go. It was time to go. I've got a lot of stuff, but uh, I know I haven't got much time. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I, I think this is important. It's important for the future that's coming. I heard people talking about, you know, the fig tree yesterday and things but you know we have to be ready we have to hear from God and we have to know we have to we have to walk by the spirit and go when we got to the Solomons uh, we really come unstuck Alan the guy who was organizing the local shipping he had given up he said it's not happening <clears throat> well we took a, a week and my two friends, unfortunately, said they had to leave. They only had a few more days. It wasn't working. They thought it was a failure. Um, so they were going to change their tickets in the morning and go. Well, it was pretty hard, um, devastating. You know, it was a personal thing that I had. I, I just trusted in what I thought was happening. And they did too. Well, that evening I couldn't sleep and I prayed and I prayed and I still didn't, I couldn't get it. It was like silence. And um, I went in and tried to wake them. The first one I couldn't wake. <laughs> um, we're all staying in a, a house up there and um, I managed to get the guy who, who I just spoke about, Albie, and I woke him and he came out and he prayed. We both prayed for a while. And then I said to him, Albie, how do you think? What do you think is happening? And he said, I think it's all right. I said, so do I, because we knew, we knew. And um, I said, look, God will take care of this. We won't say anything. It'll just happen. 
which is a, a bold thing to say. But you know, the next day we got picked up, we were taken to the port to meet the guy in the port, the head of the port. We didn't say anything. Everyone else spoke for us. We met, he took us to a ship's captain for, I think it was a Malaysian logging firm. And they said, don't you worry, we'll do it. We then had to go to someone else. He said, we'll do it, but we can't actually get your shipping containers on the vessel. There was no one in, in the capital there, at the port, who could get them on. So we went to another ship that had been in port. Once again, we met the ship's captain. He had big cranes on board and he said he'd do it, but he wasn't allowed to do it. That was after 9-11, I think, the slot, and um, and it was not, no international ship could have another ship tie up next to it. So we then got escorted up to Parliament, and they passed a, a law for the day for him to load this boat. Well, everything fell into place. We didn't even speak in Parliament. Others spoke for us. And then we watched as everything was loaded on and we were sitting. Uh, we'd left the port. We're sitting up on the back of the barge type ship looking back. At these Me and these two other guys and a couple of people from Malaita who wanted to come over. Um, looking back just as the sunset happened, you know. And the Lord reminded me and said, you know, but it, I'd said, we won't have to say anything. By the end of the day, we'll be on our way. And we were. And that began one of the lessons that, that the Lord said, you know. We, we do our part, but we're doing this with God. It's not our work, it's his work. And I've never forgotten that. It's, it's impossible to forget. And so it is with everything, everything that happens out there. You know, we, we can't abandon God or forget about him. Anything that he, he gets us to do, he's in charge. I know you're all Christians, you all realize that. But I know with the time coming, it's, you know, we have to hear his spirit walk accordingly. I heard of some ladies just the other day praying for someone in a circumstance. I know the Lord led you to prayer and the circumstances, how they worked out for that man. You all know uh, the hand of the Lord by those who walk in the spirit of God. You know, that's, that's where we must be all the time. So, um, I don't think I've got much time. This this isn't this is the type of things we have done. Even though the future for us we know is changing, we know that by the spirit. <clears throat> this hospital, same one again. It's way down on the top right hand corner. There's dual photos. You know, we'd given them a generator, but they couldn't afford the fuel. All their money that they got in, all their donations, were just to buy fuel to run the generator for five or six hours a day. So it's pretty hard. So they said they had an old generator when the place was first built. The bit on the left is the remains of the old generator. And that's all there was, apart from some power lines running from the generator shed hydro plant to the hospital. So we prayed about it. And I went over, I had a look, surveyed, and um, came back. Now, you know, when I got back, things just changed. The day, I was telling Marlene the, you know, the, what, what was happening. And that very day, a guy from Shell Oil phoned me and we knew him just not very well, but well enough. And he said, look, would you like some steel pipe? So the bit on the left is a steel pipe. And the bit on the right is a guy who, a Catholic guy who, was seeking God, I'll say that much, and um, he would come and help me. All those uh, pipes there, they were some of the pipes that were made by another company. This other company 
contacted and said, can we help you with anything? And they made pipes for the oil industry because we had to do it in sections. We had about four and a half kilometres, I think it was, of pipe to do. So we loaded containers and sent things up. We had to refurbish the turbines. The bit on the right was testing it. We used to live in a church house behind a Presbyterian church. They would help us. And when I was testing everything, I built a structure in the fire brigade. I had on the back of a truck we had. Everything's just been given to us over the years. We had this big truck. We had to make sure everything was good and hooked it up to the fire, fire pump engine, you know, and he started it up and I was there trying to shut the thing down. No one could hear me. There was a truck roaring and water was jetting everywhere. I had a few strops holding it to the deck. We had about a tonne and a half of stuff flying around. Everyone's clapping and I'm underneath all that water trying to turn it off. So the truck was starting to rip to pieces. But despite that, you know, God is there. I think he's got a bit of humour about some things. Anyway, um, when we got there, someone gave us a digger. We had to get it all over there. Everything. that We're talking huge amounts of money. Uh, but God provides everything. The digger got so far, but perhaps a half a kilometre, that's all its use was. But from the surrounding jungles, from pagan people who worship stone idols, to all the various church groups, they came in. And, you know, for a week and a half, those people dragged those pipes up the hill. I hardly had to tell them what I thought I needed. You know, these are bush people. Most of them have never read a book. They don't know how to do a lot of that. And they they carried on and they they got all these pipes up. It took us over a year to get the project going. On the right, the digger doing its little job. You can kind of see on the left photo the steepness of the penstock, they call it. That's you know, from the the highest point of the water where it really cascades down and builds up pressure to drive the turbine. I'll just see, we might need, oh yeah. Um, that's another one. Uh, during the process, people would come in. I was telling Tracy the other day, I was going up a hill and um, I could hear this puffing behind me and this lady passed me. She had three concrete blocks for this thing on the right and a bag of cement. I had a walking stick trying to get up the hill and and she she had tuberculosis it's quite distinctive and she just went straight past me you know these people despite their illness this this is life to them and all of this work is not only supporting those who are there trying to get the gospel message out but these people in, are in real need you know you can't you see it once, you can't walk away. You can't just bypass and find another route. On the right, we had to build great big settling tanks because the original one died because of rocks and things coming down, you know, when there's flooding and storms. It was a massive project. That's just some idea of scale. I'll try and speed this up. Now, Tracy, do you think you can... Um, Bring up that little video. This might help you understand these people. That worked for days like with these people. Just, just the whole of rice. Okay, move, move, move. All right. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's, I put a lot more slides in, but I really felt focused to speak about, uh, yeah, I don't think we can do much more. It's, it's having the Lord with us and not working 
away from the Lord, you know. For, for us on projects, it's it's been God provides everything. We do everything we can, obviously. The future, though, is is not so much just doing projects, although we're, we're hunting for a boat, certain style of boat, but we, can, we do have one project, which is doing water for people because they... Fresh water's gone now. It's polluted and it's difficult. You get half of their illnesses up there are from the water supply. So we're, we're changing to go to villages and we want to take the message that we're getting from you people. You've empowered us. We need to know it backwards, inside out. You know, we, we have to have the knowledge to reach people. It's all very tribal. They've had some of the gospel, but they're really reaching out for what the truth is, you know. Who is the Messiah? How, is, how does that work for those people? The same questions people here have asked but shied away from. So we want to take that. And, and going there, getting into remote villages requires for us to go and teach. This is a thing where we're, we're teaching people, talking to them about the, the gospel, and it's the true gospel we want. Working with them to give them fresh water. We have a health program that others we work with um, have developed, so we want to take that so they understand what makes them sick, things they don't realise. Give them fresh water and spend time with them. These people are all about living together and it's not just rushing in and rushing out you you've got to be there you've got to be there for them and you have to know them and love them god loves them we, we have to be the same you know now yeah I, I don't think i'll talk about it anymore i know my time is is basically up you know um i hope i've conveyed kind of what we do you know, I'm only 65. Marlene's way more youth, youthful than I am. So it's there's still hope that we can get there and do stuff. You know, we're, I was up at Maryborough, and um, I just flipped through these. We've been building a hospital, that one. I'm going back there shortly, hopefully, to kick off the building. But we went to look at this ship, and, and we're, that's what we're looking for. We think we've lost this ship. We didn't have quite enough money. But again, it's up to the Lord what will happen. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to connect. Despite Robin's good work, um, we, we value what Robin has done in connecting us with others who understand the gospel. But, um, yeah, it's going, going forward. Um, we need people... You know, all those things that have happened, I can't begin to tell you how many people have prayed. Uh, when we first went to Atawifi, every morning the nurses would get up two hours early and they would go and pray for help. They'd got, after two years, they'd, they were starting to question it. And then that, at about that two-year period is when the Lord prompted us and he organised all these people to help them. Those on the mission field need people to pray. You know, it's it's that's how Christianity works. It is a church. Okay, Tracy. Well, that was phenomenal. Thank you both so much for for what you shared. You opened uh, people's eyes, and um, unfortunately, you weren't able to tell all the stories. Maybe you could briefly no. tell the one about. Uh, Getting chased by the machete. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that um, there was a tsunami, a big earthquake uh, some years back in one part of the Solomons. Um, and I was shocked when I heard it. I just got back, I think, from a project uh, over there. And I thought, what can we do? You know, surely something. So I decided to go back and um, I got back over there and um, no one actually had actually arrived. It was two weeks 
later that I actually got up to this place, uh, Gizo region it's called, and people had no help. Most There was almost no water. Um, the earthquake was such that a lot of people there were fortunate. They had water tanks collecting off roofs, and the water had... Um, all the tanks were on their side. Um, I'd spoken to a lady, and she was in charge of all the schools in this region. I think she had 440 schools. So I got there, and I, I met uh, Dulcie, and um, she said there was a boat going. Did I have any money to hire the boat? And I'd, I'd taken $10,000, I think, Solomon. So I hired this boat. They found some fuel. And we set off the next day, went around the Sagizo Island. She wanted to show me a, a school that had been uh, destroyed. They, I think they lost about 200 people. Two, three waves came in, and the waves, uh, when they hit the shore, they were um, 60 metres high or something. They went way up the, the cliff behind the place. And a, a lot of Gilbertese people were lived there. They'd been put there by the British. Uh, their high school was gone, their village had gone. Most of the people were dead. <clears throat> there was an island called Wanonga, just, you know, a little distance, three, four hundred metres out, and that had lifted 20 metres up in the air. The people up there had no water. The island had cracked and they couldn't get down. It was just terrible. I felt overwhelmed. But while I was there, after three or four days, I, I was struggling, you know, there was... I thought there would be water, but there was no water. No one had containers. And someone said there was a hotel in the main town because it was kind of a touristy spot. And they had water. So I went down there and they said, yes, we have, but um, would you like to buy a meal? I thought, well, that's fine. I was eating crackers and an old loaf of bread at the time. Um, so I sat there and had the meal and... Um, it got dark and I thought, this is not good. There was no power. So I finished the meal and I had lots of drinks of water. And I headed off. The I was up on a hill behind a, a little house, sort of stay place. And I looked up there and it was a dark road. And I thought, I don't feel good about this. Anyway, the police station was on the corner and they had a little generator ticking away. So I went over there, but... The policemen were all asleep. Looked like they'd been drinking quite a bit of beer. So I thought, well, there's no help there. I'll just go. And I, I, I walked up the road and I got around the corner, just into the shadows. And I just got surrounded by people. And um, they were grabbing at me and all this sort of thing. And I could hear this funny noise. And one who spoke a little bit of English, he was... Uh, pulling at my shirt and come to hut was what he was saying. So I was trying to tell him in a bit of broken pigeon because I thought I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's not the place. I had all the money on me and I didn't really want to lose the money. I needed it for what I was there for. Anyway, I thought, Lord, what do I do? You know, they're all pulling me in different directions, these people. And then from nowhere, a chap appeared and I looked at this guy um, and he, he just spoke to them in their language, lifted his hand and took off. Well, they were hitting me with the machetes um, on my back, you know, but I was not cut. Uh, that didn't happen to me. I said to this particular guy, thank you. And he just said, be careful, not all humans are good. And then I turned around to look sideways and turned back and he was gone. <laughs> At that, I thought, I am out of here. And I had little jandals on and, you know, shoes that just fit around your front toes and that. <laughs> it was a dirt road and I had to run probably half a kilometre up a hill, but I did. <laughs> I was gone in the dark, couldn't see what was happening. I knew I was hitting stones, but I just kept thanking the Lord the whole way. Because, you know, the Lord takes care of us. He, he, Probably an eagle. <laughs> our hands and, um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's amazing. Uh, a few comments here that I, I made some notes here. Um, mm -hmm. So you both have really stepped out in faith and trusted God to provide for his work. And that's what's always impressed me when talking to Marlene and she shares different things like that. Um, and someone asked, uh, Carlos here, I think, or somebody, I'll pull it up in a minute, but um, how are you both able to do this work? Well, somebody asked if you were a doctor and I don't believe either of you are doctors. Um, <laughs> And Human Jesus said, uh, what do you do for a job? How are you able to do this work? Because I know you both have sacrificed a lot in order to yeah. be able to work. Um, well, I stayed back and worked as a cook in a rest home. <laughs> um, and we had been provided with a home, free home. The Lord gave us that. We were there for 15 years. Um, and then I had a couple of inheritances that were unexpected from family members and we've sort of lived on that. So, um, yeah, he's just provided and when we have really been out of money, God has prompted people to give us money and things. I mean, even once I said to David, wouldn't it be lovely to have some nice cuts of meat, you know, like, you know, a quarter of a beast and just have nice meat instead of fatty mints. And <laughs> and I'll tell you what, it was just a few days later, a lady who we had met, or David had met once from another town, she said, would you like half a beast have you got a freezer? If you haven't got a freezer for it, I've got a spare freezer too. <laughs> so he, he just has provided whatever we've needed and we've been so humbled. Yeah. What a blessing. I, I love your story about the house where you, you said that you thought to ask a, a person if, if they knew of anything. And when they said, I think you, I have something, how much do you want to pay for it? And you said, nothing. I don't I, I, <laughs> when you needed a place to store things and to live and um you, you just need to yeah, ask and trust a, god there was in a commercial property when we we sold it we had a home we built mm -hmm. and we sold that to keep you know doing the aid work because we couldn't do a mortgage and um do the aid work we decided no we have to do the aid and mm -hmm. um and found an, a, an agent a real estate agent and a see if he could help us to find a commercial property where we could maybe live in the offices and have that storage for that um, equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that all came to happen. <laughs> and, Praise, yeah. Lord. Praise mm. Lord. God provides. Um, so I know when I talked to David before, he was, you know, like you were showing uh, the different pictures with the people and you said you really need to earn the right to share. You don't just show up as, say, a missionary and talk to somebody about Jesus. You you live with them, you sleep with them, you eat with them, you're you're with them, and that that's what really earns you that right to share. Do um, you have a few words on that? Yeah, um, they traditionally, and even these days, movement is really really hard. It's, this is not countries with roads. It's pretty much all done uh, by canoes or, you know, uh, if it's associated with something that earns some money, then they might have an outboard style boat. So people see a lot of each other and uh, knowing each other builds that relationship. Um, I've witnessed others go up at various times trying trying to take the gospel as you know as they see it and and the nature of the people is you know they're, they're really pleasant we're we're so blessed to be involved with these people you know you get the odd rat bag as uh, you heard just before but mm -hmm. everyone else has just got gentle beautiful hearts you know it's mm -hmm. really wonderful 
and when you're there, they, they they pick up on things that we would miss. You know, they they notice everything about you. Mm. They notice uh, your your good points and your bad points, and and they form a, a real brotherly relationship. And then they want to know what you want to know when you become. I think I, should, I, I flipped through a few photos taken in the highlands of Guadalcanal where we went up to find coffee growers to teach them and help them. You know, we've been doing that for years uh, now. Um, up there, they call it Birao, you know, brother. They're whole, all, of, all of their villages, and there's lots of them through the jungle, you know. As a people, they call themselves Birao which means brother. Hmm. And that's indicative of what it's like, you know, real family. Hmm. And they look for that in people. And you have standing when you prove yourself as a brother. Hmm. That's a great testimony. I know you said uh, the dilemma that you're having now is trying to figure out how to share these truths in pigeon because how many words did you say, like 350? Or? Yeah, it's a very limited language. I mean, they, they can get along with that. Uh, in areas they have their own languages, There's, I'm not sure. It's a bit like Papua New Guinea. They all develop separately because of uh, tribal lands and protecting them. Um, mm. But uh, the the British bought in when they started doing coconut, this type of creole, you know, pigeon. But it is very limited. You know, the British weren't interested in really teaching them language skills or, or stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just enough for having workers. And um, I, I personally have difficulty trying to express particularly what, you know, we've learned, I suppose. <clears throat> Things that I see are important to help understand the truth of where the Trinity came from, you know, um, and, and taking that so that they might understand. They've had in various parts obviously the gospel but it's it's a, even that it's more traditional religion you know the melanesian church is anglican and it's from a hundred years ago mm. they're holding that you know i go to churches all the time and i'm asked to speak but it's very hard to overcome the traditionalism mm -hmm. because they repeat it all the time mm. you know speaks it's quite well this should be hard. easy david we'll pray for it as you said god will you. provide and i know you both are going to be getting away a little bit to seek mm. a little bit more of what he wants you to do and yeah. uh, if he helped you to get generators and hospital beds and all those things i'm pretty sure mm. he'll enlighten you how how to share yeah. this because it's his message and he wants them to hear it more than we do and um I, I think I have uh, my quote so far from the conference, and this is going to go out somewhere all over mm -hmm. newsletter maybe, where he said, I'm only 65 and Marlene is more youthful, so we still have time. So what would you say to the young people? Get, get yourself ready. Yeah, get <laughs> yourself ready. Uh, I need some workers. Um, <laughs> yeah, some of those hills are pretty steep now. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, get yourself ready. Look, there's nothing to me more rewarding than taking the gospel. Um, Great. You, it completely frees these people, you know. The, I can't speak for others because this is where the Lord has taken us, you know. Mm -hmm. Everyone has different things in this world to do and ways of doing it. God knows. Mm -hmm. We have a king. He's the organizer. And... Uh, but go, spend your, throw your life at it, everything, everything you can. Don't hold back, you know. Uh, Amen. It, Amen. He's coming back soon, and uh, we have to be ready. We have to be Amen. ready. Amen. Well, I, uh, he go needs ahead. us. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, he does. He needs, a, needs us. He uses us to do his work. He does. And if it's yep. not you, who is it over there? That's right. Yeah. Right. And 
Well, I, I was really inspired and really fell in love with Marlene besides her lovely accent in our Bible studies. Um, but when she shared with me that when you guys found this kingdom message and the truth about who God and Jesus were, and she was so distraught because this is back uh, when everything shut down. And she says, it just can't be over yet. We need to take these truths and this hope back to the islands. And I just love that attitude. And um, I, I really do love you both. And you've sacrificed so much in this life. And I, I pray many blessings on you. And I really do look forward to sitting down at the banquet table with you in the kingdom if I don't have tea with you before that. So uh, thank you so much for your service, both of you. And uh, thank you for participating in the conference. And if you have any last words other than get yourself ready, uh, feel free to share those now. Oh, thank you, Tracy, for everything you do. <laughs> and um the the people that we have met and, and the encouragement we've had and we don't feel lonely anymore <laughs> mm. when we go away we've got probably all the books that uh the people you know have written you know mm -hmm. we, we study them now but we we need to study more mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so we're ready for every eventuality Although we're going yeah. to do doing other things, it's the focus. It's mm -hmm. the truth of the gospel. You know, I used mm -hmm. to cry out to the Lord, you know, who who is this Jesus? I still felt that I didn't know him. But mm -hmm. that's greatly opened up. I know him for who he is now. Praise and, the Lord. Yeah. Praise well, the Lord, yeah. Well, we'll end with David's words of get yourself ready, no matter what age you are. If you're young or a little bit older, get yourself ready. As long as we have breath in us, God can still use us. And I do thank you both for joining us. And Lord willing, we'll see you on uh, Saturday or Tuesday. I don't know, today's Saturday. We didn't have our meeting today. Tuesday then, Marlene. And thank you both so much. <laughs> you will. Bye-bye. Thank you.